As we have a two-week gap until the next race, we thought we'd change gear and focus on something different to the current championship battle, as we've got an interview with another special guest today. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 155, where we'll be interviewing Formula One author Maurice Ham- Morris Hamilton. I'm your host, George Housen, and joining me today is Tom Horrocks from the Monkey Seat podcast. Hiya. And the man himself, Morris Hamilton. Hello there. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, Morris. How are you? How's things? I'm, I'm well, thank you. I mean, I'm um, given what's going on in the world at the moment, and when you hear some of the sad stories, I'm actually very well and very happy to be here still and still been busy and plenty to do and uh yeah so yeah it's been great been good and we've got a great championship as you as you well know through your podcast yeah we've been covering the uh, the championship battle from the very start this season it's really been something to uh, to enjoy um and something that myself and tom have been enjoying in the in the last few weeks or so has been uh, your book your tribute to uh, the great murray walker incredible which is which is out now so yeah I, I think it's best really to ask you like what let's give give a little synopsis of the book what's it about and what's been obviously been the inspiration behind it when uh, murray passed away in march of this year it occurred to me that he'd done a very extensive autobiography but that believe it or not time flies was 20 years ago and while not a lot perhaps had changed in his life since he'd written that, I had actually been in the process of, of uh, going to see him, actually, to talk a bit more about reflecting on his life, not that his not commentary had completely finished, and uh, on just life in general. But sadly, events got ahead of us. COVID came, and then he sadly, as I say, passed away in March. So I have a very good uh, literary agent and uh, called David Luxton, who had been with 20-odd years. And David got on to me and we both had a similar thought do you think there's a book in murray not so much on his his biography as such because we've read that but what other, what about other people what about the people he worked with what do they think of him and would they want to talk about him is there room for a tribute book and i and i said i i, I do believe there is yeah and i'll tell you why because in 2013 it was i think i was talking to him on the phone one day and he said to me, I'm not too good at the moment. I have a form of uh, cancer. Uh, it's just been diagnosed. And he said, I- I'm, I'm going to have to miss the British Grand Prix for the first time in donkey's years. And I- I'm really sad about it. But he said, the point is that I'm not afraid of this. I'm not afraid to talk about it. But I'm not on social media. You are. Do- if you want to say something, please do. And I said, well, do you mind if I put a tweet up just to say, look, you- you've got this, this lymphatic cancer uh, the, it, it's been caught very early and chances are very, very good. And just to say that, you know, that, that that's that's the state of play. And he said, yeah, would you do that? And I said, sure. So I, I put a little tweet up and I was absolutely blown away by what happened next. Because for, without exaggeration, for the next 24 hours, the likes and comments just kept coming. My phone just melted and it was just a constant flow of, oh, my God, oh, per Murray, oh, please send him my regards. Uh, how, you know, any news for the news, let us know. Oh, we love him. It just went on and on and on. I mean, I knew he was popular, you know. I mean, we'd all seen the reception he got at his last Grand Prix, et cetera, at Silverstone. But I had no idea it was like this. So bringing it more up to date, I said to David Luxton, look, I, I think there'll be a market in this for a book on, on Murray. No question about it. But we've got to get a talk to the people who, who, who knew him. So he said, right, go for it. So he went to, uh, he, he, he put the word, what happens is a bit, your literary agent puts the word out and publishers, if they're interested, will come back and say, well, same thing happened there. Boom. We had four or five publishers immediately say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can we have it? What's your course? <laughs> As a writer and a, and a literary agent is what you want because you want to get him into a bidding auction, you see, which is great for us. But the point was that there was an appetite for a book on Murray. So having established that, that it was on and that we were likely to, to do a deal with a publisher. I then thought, let, let me just check the lie of the land. Let me just talk to a few people who knew him to see what they think. You know, so I, I got on to the, the, the sports director of BBC at the time, Jonathan Martin. I got on to the, the head of B, ITV Sport at the time when Murray was there, Bram Barwick. I talked to Steve Ryder. Uh, I talked to Mark Wilkin, who had been the, the producer of all the Formula One stuff on Grand Prix. And just said, guys, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I'm, you're the guy to do it. Yeah, please, please. 
So I went back to the publisher. Yeah, we're on. Boom. So that was how it all came about. And then my role then was to put together this tribute to, to Murray. In the end, I talked to 43 different people over time. Over Thank God for Zoom. Jeez, you know, because 18 months ago, I'd never heard of it. <laughs> and boy, did I use it uh, in, the, in the nine months. I mean, it was been wonderful because it just saved me having to go the length and breadth of the country, just doing it all here. And again, the, the same thing happened. The people just were, you know, you know, when you do a book sometimes and you're doing a biography, say, and it's about a character, and they'll have a dark side. We all, you know, everyone does. And so you come to the awkward bits and people sort of say, ah, yeah, look, I, I don't know what to say about this, or, mm, or the, the element they are. But with Murray, it was just an outpouring of love and affection from everybody that worked with him, and loads of stories. So I was spoiled for choice in the end. I mean, I had so much stuff coming in, that, and I had a very limited time to do it because the publisher said, we want to get it out before Christmas, obviously. So your role, I'm afraid, is we want your copy in by the end of June. <laughs> so I thought, bloody hell, uh, that's taking going to take some time. But anyway, we did it. And it was a case of managing the book. By that, I mean, uh, I had so much stuff that I had to sort of make sure I got it all in, in the right place, because I had to give the book some sort of form. And um, so that was quite a, a, an interesting challenge, which I enjoyed very much. So that that's really how the book came about. And, uh, and here we are. It's, it's now in print. It's amazing. It's such a short period of time. Because I was going to ask you uh, whether this was in the works before Murray sadly passed away. Because obviously, it's such such a you know such a lot of information and so so many uh, so many pieces from from lots of different people that I couldn't see how you could have possibly got it all together in in the time since his passing. But it's incredible that you've done it in such a short period of time. I mean, how do you even begin to create a narrative and something you know that stretches for over such a long period of time? And especially like you say, trying to avoid doing a doing a biography as such, given that it, it's been done you know to great success before. I mean, where do you even start with that? Yeah, that, that was the big question. I mean, uh, you're quite right, Tom, because you, what you want to avoid is the, he was born in West Midlands on blah, 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 on the first line, you know, we had to. So I had to think of something to, to lead us into, to say who he was. And of course, the, the thing that just came to mind immediately. So you think about his great commentaries and you think about lots of the exciting moments and there are many, many of them. And the one that sprang to mind immediately was the 1986 Australian Grand Prix when Nigel had the incredible look at that 186 mile an hour, whatever it was, blowout. So we used that to paint the picture of, of Murray Walker. And that tied in nicely because he was a massive, massive uh, personality in Australia. And the Australians love him. I mean, absolutely loved him. So that tied in beautifully to be able to explain about that. And, I, and having been at that race, I got to know a lot of the Australian media very well. And one guy in particular, who was a, Bob, a guy called Bob Jennings, who was a motoring correspondent of the Adelaide Advertiser, which was the local paper, which gave it miles of coverage. And, uh, and I, I got in touch with Bob and said I was doing the book. And, oh, and Bob just was, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 mate, yeah. And they uh, gave me a lot of stuff. So that got the ball rolling. But then, yes, where do you go after that? It had to form a sort of chronological basis, really, because uh, – the story of Murray was how he gradually got into it and how it evolved and how he had his job in advertising, but then he became a commentator more and more and more. And also what I hadn't thought about, but what actually happened as the book took form was that I found I was actually telling the story of motorsport broadcasting and how it's grown enormously from when it start, when he started in 49 and then through into the 60s and, and into the 70s to, to what we've got today, this explosion. Here we are doing a podcast, you know, which, of course, 20 odd years ago was just unheard of. So the coverage was very, very minimal. And so the story of Murray reflects that as well. So, so it, was, it was actually a very nice uh, thing to be able to do because I enjoyed that, going back and reflecting on it because, of course, my grey hairs will tell you I was there. I, I heard it all. I, I saw it all happen. So it, it was a pleasure to do. I bet it was. Yeah. I mean, like to bring it back a little bit, what you were saying about, I mean, I remember that tweet from 2013. I've only just realized now that it was actually you that, that you that sent that it's been, it's been eight years. And, you know, I remember seeing that and think, you know, it, you know, my, I just sank like my, my stomach just sank. It was like, you got bad, bad news about a grandparent or something like that. You know, they're in trouble. They've got cancer. It was, it was like that. And I've never met him. I've never met the guy. And, and that's the, and that I'm sure that was the same for the, 
tens or hundreds of thousands of people that saw and, and liked and retweeted that tweet. That's what he meant to so many people. And he transcends the generations as well. You know, people in the Twitter generation will, in the social media generation love him. I, I know I've known him from YouTube. That's how I know him. I started watching Formula One a good few years after after he retired. And I just heard about this guy who, who did a commentary for the German Grand Prix in 2007, just like, who is this guy? He's really exciting. Like, just he's done many more commentaries. <laughs> Turns out he was the greatest broadcaster in the history of Formula One. And, you know, it, and that, that's really how I got to live. And I really liked going through the book as well and, and like reading the the quotes, the like, the commentary that, that you put in as well from um from what he was saying live in the broadcast. It's really nice to go through all that. But I mean, you've said you said that obviously you were at Adelaide in 1986 and that you've met Murray a number of times. I think you met Murray Walker, I think it said in the book 1977 was the first time you met him. So how did that come about? What I don't I don't think you've I don't think you mentioned too many times when you actually met him. Have you got any stories from when you were uh, actually experienced the great Murray Walker in person? Well, funnily enough, um, the first time I actually met him was when I was a, fa- a race fan, not, not a professional journalist. And I was with my dad. My dad was a great fan of motorsport, and that's how I got into it. He, he sort of enthused me and took me from the age of seven to, to motor races, and that was it. I was hooked. And we were on a Page and Moy trip together to my dad and I to the Monaco Grand Prix in 73. And I remember it very, very well. It was a Monarch Airlines flight out of Luton down to Nice. And on the way back, we Murray Walker was on our flight. And would you believe it? He sat in the seats for a three by three and he sat with my dad and I. That's where he happened to sit. So we got talking to him, which was just, I mean, he was just God. I mean, he was, you know, this is 73. So he was well into uh, he, he, we knew who he was. We'd, we'd, we'd seen all his broadcasts and, 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 and heard him uh, on radio before that. So we knew who he was and he was just so easy to talk to. Um, we chatted and he was and he wanted to talk. No surprise, I suppose. Um, but he just wanted to talk about the race and about this and that and the other. And so my dad and I were made up. You know, we just we'd, we'd flown home with Murray Walker. So that was the first time. I mean, when in subsequent years, when I mentioned that, of course, he wouldn't remember and I wouldn't expect him to because because people, as you probably saw and read in the book, people were talking to him all the time. But the first time professionally, I don't actually remember. I don't remember a specific instance because when you uh, I've been I was on the fringes for a while when I moved to England in 1970 to, to live and to get into this business. I was hanging about. I was always being a nuisance, being everywhere and uh, to the races I could get to and bumming way into the paddock. And, and so I would have met him uh, socially, but in a group, not one to one. And I can't recall a specific occasion. But I do know that when you met Murray, there was no airs or graces. There was no side to him. There was no sort of, well, who the hell are you? You know, he actually, when he if, when he saw you, I'm sure it would have been the same as me. It would have been, oh, I've heard about you. Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Murray Walker. Yeah, well, I know who you are. But he would tell you that and he would just chat away to you and just make you feel at home. And and it just it just seemed to grow. I mean, it just, uh, you know, you it, it doesn't happen so much today, but um, certainly in the 70s and 80s, when we were at a, um, a race in Europe or, or a flyaway race, the media would, would socialise a lot more than they're able to do today. And we'd go out in groups and if there was, and the sponsors actually did a lot more. They would have sponsor dinners and team dinners happened a lot more then than does now. And invariably, if you go to one of those, Murray would be there. Well, in fact, it wouldn't be, you know, if it, if, when Murray walked into the room, you thought, oh, good, all's well. It's, this is proper. Murray's here. So you would, you would be, you'd end up sitting beside him, perhaps, and just just chatting. You know, just just um, if just so so lovely to talk to. And then did interviews over time, and went down to see him down in Hampshire at his home, uh, in his unbelievable st- studio. And yeah, it was just a gradual, lovely, lovely process. I loved uh, in in the book. There's some lovely stories that you that you've told there, and. Um, and really bringing back memories from from when I was a child watching Formula One and, and hearing Murray's voice and and I loved the way in the book that you used uh, you used exact quotes because you can it it really it really brought the memory of the voice home and like the there was such an emotive moment towards the end of the book you know, reading the words of of his final broadcast was it in the uh, Indianapolis 
race yeah. uh, and and th- those final those final words that he gave and I actually found myself just welling up because I could actually hear Murray's voice and his his voice just brought so much joy into uh, into into everyone's everyone's lives and and as as mentioned several times in the book nobody had a bad word to say and they always forgave the mistakes because you know as Murray rightly said you know the prophecies that very uh, <laughs> very soon uh, proved to be wrong and uh, and I love the way that he would just always poke fun at himself as well and uh, and if, if there was if there's a particularly uh, dull somber moment in the conversation he would uh, start to commentate on himself and like uh, getting <laughs> getting the porridge and all that kind of stuff he's just really there's just some really great lovely moments in in the book that uh, I think will just bring a lot of a lot of smiles to people's uh, to people's faces but as like back for for you how is it what do you personally get out of documenting someone's life and creating this work that people can read and get so much joy what purpose what actually do you get out of that you get a lovely warm feeling inside it's as simple as that particularly when you get to the end and there's always when you get to the end of any book there's a a massive relief because you know you particularly if you've hit your deadline which i always try to do you just go because it's been your life for two to three months you know you're 24 7 six days a week trying to take one day off if i can but you're flat out doing it you're thinking about nothing else and it's a relief to hand over the words to the publisher on the deadline and uh, because it's consumed you uh, particularly one whether where you're on a very tight deadline it's absolutely every strain of you has just been used to produce this but then when it's about somebody like murray when you feel you're doing something that you wanted to do. It was bringing back lovely, lovely memories that you were involved in personally and remember it so, so well. And then having spoken to so many people and they're all, they're, they're all actually grateful that you're, you're doing this, you know, with they're, they're, they're saying, thanks. I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad somebody's doing this because it would be a sin if, you know, the, the world in years to come didn't know about this man who's who's been a pleasure to work with and to know. A lot of the, the, the younger generation won't know that. So it's great to be able to do it. So all of that, I mean, it's, it's, I had a similar feeling uh, when I wrote a book on Ken Tyrrell because Ken had been like a surrogate father to me when I started in 77 as a, as a professional. And Ken, uh, the Tyrrell factory was not far from where I used to live. And uh, I would spend quite a bit of time there. I was actually working for a journalist who worked did worked on uh, a guy called Ian Young, who did a lot of the public relations work for Tyrrell as well. So I got involved doing a lot of the legwork. So I got to meet Ken very, very early on. And uh, he, he was stern old bugger, you know, but he, but he kept me straight. He was wonderful. Uh, he would, if, if I'd write something, the phone would ring on Monday morning. Ken was very blunt on the phone and uh, you'd pick it up and he wouldn't even say it's Ken here. He'd go, read your piece. Very nice. Bye. Boom. And you think, oh, okay, oh, gone, you know, <laughs> or, 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 or it would simply be you pick it up and you go, rubbish. What were you thinking of when you wrote that? See you in Adelaide, bang. You know, it was like, it was just like that. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, we had this fantastic. But he was a he was a terrific man to work with. And anyway, I kept pestering him to do, got to do your book, Ken. You've got to do you, yours. Uh, you got such a fantastic story. Former timber merchant. You find Jackie Stewart, blah, 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 the whole story. No, 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 no. He said, no, I, no, but we would want to read a book on me. And he wasn't being modest. He just, that's the way. He did. No, no, no. And he wouldn't have it. He simply wouldn't have it. So when he sadly passed away, I got to know, obviously, his two sons, Kenneth and Bobby, very well. And um, I immediately went to them and they said, do it. Just do it while it's still fresh and while... Mrs. Tyrrell, Ken's, Ken's wife, Nora, was still around, but she was not very well. So I got to see Nora and got the whole story there and got the family's full approval and full backing. And again, it was because if I hadn't done it, nobody else was going to do it. And it had to be done quickly. And we got it done. And uh, it just was a lovely feeling to have ticked that box and paid tribute to, to this incredible man, Ken. So similar feeling with Murray. You know, you've, writing is what I do. Uh, it's my profession, so you get paid for it, and the box tick, fine. But there's certain cases when it's over and above that, when it's very deeply personal. And the Murray book most certainly was. It was just, um, it, it, it was a work of love, no question. Yeah, and 
summing up nearly a hundred years of a man's life as well, you know, and in the way that he did, I thought he did an excellent job with it. It was really good to read. Thank you. And, nice I, and I feel as well, like, I mean, this is a, this is a difficult one to answer because there's, there's just so many, you know, so many moments, obviously with Murray, when it came to his commentating, when it came to people meeting him, the amount of people that he met during his life and, and the amount of races that he commented, I mean, he commentated on, you know, F1 before it was F1 in 1949. He commented all the way until 2001, so over 50 years. And I'm just wondering what your personal favourites are, because like Tom said, you 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 put the quotes in as as Murray said them. And it, when I when I was reading them as well, it did feel like I was reading directly more like what Murray was saying. And I could I could hear his voice, you know, when you're reading you, I could hear Murray's voice saying like 3.4 seconds or you know, <laughs> things like that, you know. So I'm just wondering what your personal favourites are when it came to his commentating. Yeah, just going back to that point about um, using his quotes, when I was thinking about how to do the book, it was immediately apparent to me that that I had to do that because it was such a part of him. But the publisher, Penguin, they they weren't so sure. And they said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel this is the way to do it. And they said, OK, well, look. Do the first couple of chapters and let's have sight of them. Let's let's see how that works because we, you know it, it sounds a bit. You know, are people going to want to read that? And I said, I think they are, because when I even start to write them down, I it's, it's I, I hear his voice. I hear his voice straight away. As Tom was saying, you know, you're immediately reminded of that particular race because it's there. And kind of that voice. It's it's there. You're right there with him. So they said, okay. So I did the first couple of chapters to say, and I sent it in. And uh, they came straight back and said, yep, that works. That's great. Yeah, we see what you mean now. Yeah, it has to be. And they said, we we aren't motorsport fans, but we have heard enough of Murray to know when we read those quotes that, yeah, we could hear his voice too. And so that works. So I said, good. And so the the next question was, what do I put in? And there has to be some outstanding ones. And the one that I always, always, always is going to have in no matter what was the 1982 Monaco Grand Prix, <laughs> because that chaotic final few laps was Murray in his element. And in fact, it was so, I didn't have to think hard about that because at the time I was editing the Autocourse Annual. And of course, it had been such a, an extraordinary race that when I was, and I was, used to write the reports for Autocourse on, on every Grand Prix. And uh, I remember thinking, how the heck am I going to sum this race up? Because you had a, there was an introductory paragraph which summarized the race. Okay, so I thought, how on earth to summarize this? And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take Murray's commentary and use that to summarize the, the race. And that's exactly what I did. And, and it does. Uh, because there you've got things, you know, that great line of where, where uh, Prost is going to win it. And, and bang, off he goes. And then Peroni's in the lead. And so he says, oh, there did he, Peroni's going to go now for it. And is that Peroni stop? It is. I mean, it was just the incredible. And then Patrese spins off and then he's gone mental. And uh, this and uh, that that was great. Then lots of other, I had any excuse to get in um, those quotes from the rallycross, do you remember? Where the, yes. where the, guy, the guy's got the holes in the windscreen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the car crashes straight into the back. You can't um, make that stuff up, can you? you That's you, just you, gold. <laughs> absolutely. You know, so, and then, I mean, as we said earlier, Mansell to uh, Adelaide was, was again, Murray Gold. But, yeah, uh, yeah, just those are the main ones. But I think uh, other ones, I, I had, um, I was very, very fortunate. In uh, There's a guy called Richard Wiseman, and uh, he specialises in digging out archives broadcasting archives uh he knows where to go to find these things uh, and i i didn't ask too many questions because of some of the questions he, he didn't want me to ask but where'd you get that because he i'm not sure how it was done but anyway he got me some uh, videos of of past races and there was stuff that i hadn't been thinking of putting in and and, and did so i'm just trying to think of one in particular but i um let me think. Well, I certainly I did. I'd never heard the 1949 British Grand Prix, his very first broadcast. I didn't think that there were there were tapes of that available, but there is. So to get that and and, and bless him. I mean, he makes a mistake. He makes two or three mistakes in that he, he, he identifies the wrong car. He's he's up at Stowe Corner and he's the sort of second commentator. And Max Robertson is the main commentator and up opposite the pits. And in the 49 1949 British Grand Prix, Murray. Uh, mistakes the leading car for somebody else uh, somebody else for the leading car and gets it wrong but but in such a lovely way and uh 
you know, I think that that's part of it, as you said earlier, the mistakes, very few commentators you can say this about, about but the mistakes are part of Murray because he's not, he's, he's making mistakes not because he's been careless, uh, not because he's stupid. It's because all the information's in his head and it's all trying to come out in a rush. And this torrent of words, it, it gets them a bit mixed up. I think it was, was it Martin Brundle that said his, his mouth is 500 revs ahead of his brain. You know, it just doesn't quite come out sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, with that as well, you're the, the mistake. I remember there was one where there was literally, I think it was the first race he commentated on and there was somebody that ended up upside down pretty much underneath him. I think, was that, uh, was that the first race? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just what a, a baptism of fire. And uh, <laughs> and you, like you say about about him making the mistakes there and and him being so kind of self-critical in some ways. But then the lovely story that was in there about was it John Watson who had the headphones on in the booth next door and was didn't realize he was mic on and he was he was swearing at Murray because he was making so many mistakes of like. To, to think like such a professional to then come out and actually be laughing about it and thanking him for pointing out his mistakes, just absolutely phenomenal story. And, and yeah, there's just, just, I, I would, uh, I plead any, anyone who's, uh, who's looking for a Christmas present for your, for your dad, or if you love Murray yourself to, to go out and get this book as a Christmas present. Cause it's, uh, it's, it's brought me a lot of joy over the last few weeks, just, just remembering all these, these lovely memories, but, uh, looking forward So you, you finished the book, obviously in, in very quick time there. And, uh, I, I've, I've seen it. It's, it's also a, an audio book and I noticed the, uh, the, the the reader was a, a slightly comma a slightly uh, a familiar name. Would you like to kind of fill us in on on that? Oh my goodness! Yes, yes, um, <laughs> it's me. And yeah. I, uh, I first first audiobook I've ever done. Not something I had ever thought of doing. Uh, I didn't ask to do it, but because you know, obviously, read listen to audiobooks as as we all were, and and the people that read them are really fantastic because they've got that voice that they sound like they smoke about eighty a day. With that deep sort of syrupy voice, and they're 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 breathing, and the and the way they read the sentences are perfect, perfect, and they're just so calm and everything. And I really take my hat off to them because it's a lot of a lot of work. Anyway, the publisher said, "So we're going to do an audiobook, and we'll get somebody." But we're thinking, you know, that the professional readers won't necessarily know about Murray Walker, and they might not fully understand, particularly as there's so many quotes in here where the emphasis should be and how he would have been at that time. Do you want to give it a go? I said, God, uh, uh, do you think so? And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Send us some, um, uh, do, do two minutes on your phone and send it to us. Just, just take any chapter you like and do two minutes. So I did. And they said, yep, it's okay. You're a bit fast. And that's no surprise because being from Northern Ireland, we tend to talk, gabble a lot. And my wife's always saying to me when I'm doing after dinner speaking, she's always saying, slow down, for God's sake, slow down, because I'm talking like that and I get excited. And so they, they said, you're going to slow down a bit, but we can, we, we, we're, we can coach you, you know, it'll be all right. So Crack your Murray impression as well, I have to say, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right. So it, so it was Penguin Random House of the Publishers. And I should have known that they, they have been incredibly professional. I mean, incredibly, really, really impressive. So they've got these studios in Vauxhall. And I mean, audiobooks are big business. I didn't realize. They are a massive business for a publisher. And, and Penguin have got three studios, purpose-built studios, in a brand new building opposite the American embassy, the new American embassy. And they are busy all the time just doing these audiobooks. So I had a, a producer would come with me, sat the other side of the glass, it's a perfect soundproof studio, everything's there for you, and the, and the book's on a, an iPad, and you scroll up forward and you, and you read. I have to say, it was three days, and it was the hardest job I've ever done. It was so hard, because when you write something, so let's say you're, you've got a piece to write, and you're doing it for a magazine, and you guys are doing something that you're going to read on air, you would write it differently as I've discovered, having broadcast myself, you know, if I'm doing a piece that I'm going to read, I, I write it differently to how I would write it for a magazine. But of course, this is a book which is written, all the grammar is the way you'd want it in a book, but it's not necessarily how it is when you read it because you're, the commas where you would pause when you read it, but, but not when you're reading it out loud, it's different. And so I was stumbling a bit and, and at the end of the first day, I'd lost my voice. 
and even though they were plying me with water and all the rest of it, and uh, they, they knew all the tricks of the trade. And I came home and um, said to the missus, uh, I, I don't know if I can carry on with this. Um, it's, it's very, very tough. And so they, the penguin guys said to me, look, tomorrow, just take your time. You've got all the time in the world. We'll shorten the day and uh, we'll give you much more, to, you know, make sure you've got everything to drink and honey and all the rest of it. And I found that one of the things was that dairy products are not good. I, had, I was getting Qatar uh, d- during the, towards the end. And um, it's, for me, it's dairy products. So I cut out all dairy products and I drank a lot of water, took my time and second and third days were fine. Even so, it was incredibly tough. But what I did enjoy, of course, was Larry doing the commentary because I knew exactly what to say when. Incredible. And, and they loved all that. And they said, that's what really works. That, that has been fantastic. So I hope I've, I've, I've done them credit. But if you are listening to the audio version, please excuse the stumbles here and there because I did stumble. And that's the other thing too. So impressive. The, the editor, the producer, you guys would probably know more about this than I do, but the machinery they've got where he would just say, no, 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 just do that sentence again. I said, shall I go back to the beginning? No, no, just that. And he would cut and edit as he was going. He would be just amazing. I mean, amazing, because there's 80,000 words over three days, and he's putting it all down and just cutting and editing and doing it all, the rest of it. They made, they made my life so much easier. They really did. So it was, it was one interesting experience, to answer your question. It really was. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into things like that. And like you say, you always, you know, the way you say something is not necessarily the way that you write something as well. So I, I could definitely relate on that. I did a very short, short audio book for my for my girlfriend's book. And it, it so I think it only ended up being about five minutes long. Um, but it took a lot longer than that to actually record. Yeah. <laughs> as is always the way. <laughs> so Murray is and will remain for a long time, I think, for maybe forever as the vo- voice of motorsport, at least in the English speaking world anyway. You know, the guy the guy was iconic and the guy is iconic. And I don't mean this disrespectfully to any of the other people, for example, like Martin Brundle. I think he's I think he's fantastic. He's a brilliant commentator and broadcaster. And I think Martin himself will admit this as well. There will never be anybody like Murray Walker again. But, the guy the guy is literally a legend. And that's the that's the word that gets used a lot. But I, th- I think it was a quote again in the book that said that it's very apt for Murray. It's absolutely accurate for him. Yes, it is. He Murray was a, a man of his time. By that, I mean, he was broadcasting in the days when there was only one platform, BBC. OK, so in those days, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there would be in football, Kenneth Wollstone home, the voice of uh, there'd be Peter Allison golf, there'd be Harry Carpenter boxing. There would be Peter O'Sullivan doing horse racing. There would be John Arlott doing cricket. So as soon as you heard those voices, they represented the sport they were talking about. They, that was it, end of. So with Murray, it was motorsport, okay? So he was a man of that particular time. Now, as you well know, we've got multi-platforms. There's all different, uh, different places you could go to, to hear commentary on races. And there's no sort of one, with the greatest respect to them all, they're all thoroughly professional doing their job but there's no one voice as there was in murray's day so he just right for it he was there at the right time and of course uh, as we're all saying he had the right voice for this job i mean can you imagine him commenting say on snooker or something you know he just he just couldn't have done it but it was perfect for motorsport and also this what i learned from this and as you will have read was the the comments of people like steve Ryder and mark wilkin the producer and um, Neil Duncanson, who was the ITV producer, that Murray had this fantastic ability to be able to adjust his tone to the mood and then raise it when needed and drop it again and bring it up and drop it again, almost without any sort of you didn't you weren't aware, you were you it was happening without you noticing yet it was happening you know and he like that one um, Neil Duncanson said in the days of Michael Schumacher leading every race in the early 2000s, and some of them were a bit tedious, would say, turn it up to 11, Murray. And he did. And he'd find something to say. And up he'd go. And he would just raise the tempo a little bit and then bring it back down again and then raise it again and bring it back down again. Like it's second nature to him. And, and that was the most fantastic thing that he, that ability he had. And it was just so well suited to this job of being a Formula One 
stroke motorsport commentator and it was just a perfect voice a perfect tone and I, I mean i remember being with him having dinner one night and um and somebody some this subject came up actually it was, it was somebody that was at the table we, were, we must have been abroad somewhere and the person at the table didn't know much about murray they said murray we said murray show them what we mean you know just so he said, so he started to say, well, when I'm talking about a race and, and, and this is happening, and that, but if something exciting happens, I just get an, an off he went. And it was incredible. He just went boom. And then he brought it back down again. It was fantastic. He just did it like that. It was just so second nature to him. I mean, he wasn't, it, it wasn't a struggle. And uh, that's why I think the comedies were so good because he was doing what he loved doing, telling you and I what was going on. Yeah, I loved how he was still learning, even in the even in the late nineties when uh, when he had to learn how to deal with uh, advertisement breaks from ITV as well. As a, it's really interesting to hear how, like, even in in those advanced years when he's you know what, what was he? He's only sort of four years away from retiring, and and yet he's still learning more about how to how to how to deliver in the commentary booth. It's just fascinating. But uh, as we alluded to earlier, um, before we started the, uh, the podcast about you, you've done some other books as well, uh, just one or two in the past. I was absolutely knocked it back when I just, I, I looked at how many books you've done in the past. And uh, I, I recently read your, your book on Nikki Lauda and, and oh. that one very, very similar emotion wise to, to that one as well. And I just really wanted to ask you what, like, what was the what was the similarities with uh, with this book to to that book? Because because uh, the Nicolada book especially was particularly gut wrenching at times and and just really brought up some some you know taught me a lot about the man himself. And so, what are the the, the differences and the similarities with that book in particular and other books you've done compared to this one? Well, as, as, thank you for saying that, Tom. It's nice to hear because Nicky Lada book was very became very special and very personal because it was very similar to Murray and to Ken Tru. Because uh, I was I was doing a job for Nikki, and and the Formula One people wanted to see this job done, and it was a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to do, particularly for me because, uh, as I said in the book, I'd come to England in 1970. I'd gone to Mallory Park, to the I couldn't wait for the season. To, you know how it is over the winter; you're you're itching to get going. You can't wait for the season to start, and the first race was at Mallory Park, a Formula Two international. And Nicky, like this, this young kid, Nicky Lido, was in a yellow, bright yellow march, privately entered march, bought from a, brought money from an Austrian bank, and I happened to take a picture of him. Don't know why, it just there was nobody else around him. This kid was sitting in this car, and I just went over and took a picture. I had visions then of being a photographer, I think, rather than a writer. Anyway, and then as time went on, of course, I got into motor racing and, and became a journalist. And got to know him. You never really got to know Nicky really well. He, but, but that's the way it was with him. You know, he was very uh, pragmatic and very down to earth. And if he thought you were okay, you were okay. If he didn't like you, you knew about it. So uh, I remember being told by my old friend, the late Alan Henry, who knew Nicky extremely well, better than me. He just said, don't mess about. You know, if you're going to interview him, get your questions ready. And be prepared. Be, <laughs> Alan said to me, the first, the first interview I really did with Nicky was in 84 in Detroit. And it was the year of his comeback. It was 82, sorry, excuse me, 82. And uh, it was the year of his comeback. And um, I said to Alan, listen, will you, will you, we're in the pit lane. It was, it was after morning practice on the first day, Friday. And uh, I said, listen, will you introduce me to Nicky? Because, you know, if you introduce me, Nicky will probably think, well, he must be all right if Alan's introducing me. So that was the plan. And I, well, what I'm going to say to him is, Nicky, can I come and interview you later? Uh, at a time convenient to yourself to talk about your comeback, because you were, were already about four or five races in and he'd won, one, he'd won at Long Beach. So it was a good story. When I was writing for um, 83, 82, I was writing for The Guardian. That's right. So I was going to do an interview for them. Alan said to me, be ready. He may just say to you, do it now. I said, you're joking. He said, no, no, he, he may. So first, the morning practice is finished and the pits in Detroit are open pits, right? There was a, Because the cars were garaged further away in Cobo Hall. So they had to bring all the kit down and then there's open pits and it was chaotic. There was people everywhere and mechanics everywhere and, and all the rest of it. And he's standing there and Alan introduces me and uh, I say, Nikki, um, I'd like to come and have a chat too. Okay, start, do it now. And, and Alan said, you'll do this because this will be a test to see if you're any good or not. 
in, and if you fumble now, you've had it. So be prepared. So, okay, start, do it now. So, uh, okay, and luckily, I had the questions in my head. I had the tip recorder in my hand, and I just restarted. Okay, good, and we got it all done, and that was fine. And from then on, I was, quotes, okay. So the relationship then built up over time, and I did lots of good interviews with them. And again, you, you would sit down, you would tell them, I want to do this interview. It's going to be about this, this, and this, uh, and it's for this publication. Okay, start, good. And so long as he knew, and so long as he knew what you wanted, you'd get fantastic. And he would tell it like it was. That was the thing. Even when he'd retired from racing, the beauty of having Nicky Lauda in the paddock for us, for journalists, was fantastic. Because if there was an issue going on, as always is, okay, there's always there's always something going on. I mean, like like now, for example, if Nicky was around now and we were talking about the Brazil clash between Lewis and Max, okay. And you'd be thinking, well, I don't know what to make of this. I just, uh, I'm, I've heard both sides and I'm, uh, I'm really struggling. I'll go and see Nicky. You'd say, you go to Nicky, can you just give me your views? And he would always start, it's very simple. And he'd just go bang, 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 bang. And you'd go, and it'd be one side or the other. There'd be no, no middle ground. It would be, okay, boom, 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 boom. And you'd go, okay, you're absolutely right. It'd be so clear after he'd spoken to you. And it was just a pleasure to talk to him. And towards the end, we had some very long chats, and particularly about the airline, because, of course, the thing that uh, I hope the book brought out, which I hadn't realized, was just the trauma of that crash in Thailand when 230 people are killed in a lighter air, uh, 767, which was the most horrendous thing. And he, sp- and he just spoke about it unemotionally. Uh, and explained it all and what he had to go through. He had to take Boeing on. I mean, what a story, taking Boeing on and proving them at fault. Incredible story, but told matter-of-factly. And, of course, the great the, – the, the, <laughs> the, the, his, his disrespect for Boeing and, and for authority was um, would always come out if he felt that he was messed about. I mean, he, he, would, he would admire anybody who, who knew what they were doing and made sense to him. But if you tried to mess him about or if you appeared to be fumbling what you did, he had no time for that. And uh, that great story in the book, which, which I'll just repeat very briefly because it, it sums him up, when he was making the first maiden flight from Vienna to Sydney, and it was a big deal in the 777, and it was going to be a big deal for Lauder Aud- Aud- because they'd put one over on Austrian Airlines because it was a bit like British Airways and, and Virgin, you know, it was that sort of battle between the two. And uh, the day before he's due to leave with all the dignitaries on board, it was going to be a, not a commercial flight, but a, an inaugural flight. It got all the, the proper people, the industry people on board. And they rang from um, Australia and said, you can't come. Why not? Because their paperwork's not in order. We haven't got the right paperwork for your aircraft. This is bullshit. I know this. OK. And he knew it was bullshit, as he put it. And so he knew that somebody was trying to mess him about. So and he, and he just said to them, listen, I have 232 people here. Uh, we are all ready to go. I'm coming. If you don't like it, you can shoot me down. <laughs> Apparently, he actually said that. <laughs> he actually said this to the <laughs> aviation authorities in Australia. You can shoot me down. And he, and he took off and went because there was no trouble at all. But that was him. I mean, oh fantastic. God. He's gold dust. He was just wonderful to talk to. Wonderful. Yeah. So it was a, a, a to answer, sorry, a long answer to your question. Fa- a wonderful book to do. Love doing it. Absolutely love doing it. No, a, a fantastic. Don't apologize for that. That was that was a fantastic answer and a great story. You know, Nicky, Nicky Lauda, he was a lot of things, but he was not a man who lived with fear. He went through the absolute worst, didn't he? So I suppose something like that to him, it, it's just nothing. He'll just do what he wants. <laughs> He's Nicky Lauda. What are you going to do about it? I mean, I'm just scrolling through some of your books here as well. I mean, there's, there's one about Frank Williams. There's one about James Hunt. There's one about Ayrton Senna. I mean, you've obviously been around the F1 paddock for a very long time. Is, is there any other, any other stories you want to tell from those guys or some else perhaps well let me see i'm just looking at them up here um Ayrton senna now that's an interesting story from my point of view because Ayrton and i didn't get on very well we didn't see eye to eye and the the, the, the story i hope we've got enough time to tell you this this anecdote when Ayrton arrived he was obviously the bee's knees. He was going to be fantastic. I mean, I'd seen him in Formula 3 up against Brundle. That was that was an epic season, by the way. Epic season in Formula 3. Those two were at it hammer and tongs. And Ayrton was, was really being pushed by Martin. I mean, fair play to Martin. Very, very good driver. Very, very good driver. Anyway, he gets into Formula 1. He has his year with Tolman in 84. 
He's with Lotus in 85, John Player Lotus. And I'm at the first Australian Grand Prix in Adelaide in 85, the end of 85. So it's the end of the season, everybody's relaxed. And I've been commissioned by an American magazine. I'm just trying to remember the name of it, a big one, big glossy magazine. And they said, this guy out in Senna, he sounds good. Can you do tell us a little bit about him? So I said, yeah, okay. So I went up to it and uh, it was actually, we were, we were walking back from the press conference. Media Centre was a long way from the paddock in Adelaide in those days. And he was literally walking back across the, it was a ra- horse race course, walking back across the grass with uh, one minder with him. And I just went up and we just chatted as we went along. And I said, can I come and interview you? He said, yeah, okay. He lived, he was renting a house at that time in Esher in Surrey. After the season had finished, I went up to the house in Esher. He was sharing this house with Maurizio Guzelman and his wife, Stella. So the three of them were in this big five-bedroom detached house in Esher, right? Living in the kitchen because they had no furniture. They were living in a picnic bench in the kitchen. Uh, and we had, we had some lager and peanuts. And I had this most fantastic interview with Ed and, and Maurizio and Stella sat in on it and were passing comment and all the rest of it. And it was brilliant. So I, I did the story. It got published and it was, they made a fantastic job of it. And I was really pleased. And I thought, I'm well in here. This kid's going to be good. And I've got to, got to know him really well. And that was wonderful. Get to the start of the next season, 86. We're at the French Grand Prix, which was quite early. Uh, I think it was the third, second or third race. It was very early, I remember, at Paul Ricard. And I had I'd seen him in Brazil, and it had been his birthday. And he kind of blanked me. And I thought, well, it's his birthday. It's Brazil. He's busy, busy, busy. Never mind. So then I, I, I bump into him in the paddock in uh, Paul Ricard. And he lays into me. He's going, you, and he's poking me with his finger. He said, you, I bring you to my house and you, you, you let me down. You write these nasty things. And I'm thinking, what, what? I've written, I've written anything nasty. Yes, you have, you have. And he was adamant and he was furious. And Anne, Br- Anne Bradshaw, who was uh, the lovely lady who's still around, was the PR lady for Lotus. And she said, what the hell have you done? I said, Jesus, Annie, I don't know. I have no idea what I've done. I don't know what's brought this on. And he saw me later again. He said, yo, you read, you look, you look. And I said, what, what, what's he talking about? So uh, I, I thought through everything. And I knew it wasn't in that piece in the magazine because it was, it was 100% positive the piece in the magazine. Then I remembered that I used to do a thing called Old Mo's Almanac, which was a kind of bit of a piss take on, on the year just gone by. I'd always do it at the beginning of each season where I'd predict what might happen, but, but a play on what had happened in the previous year. All a bit of fun. And if you remember, Ayrton had blocked Derek Warwick and had got J- Johnny Dumfries in as the number two because he, he, he thought that Lotus couldn't do two good cars they, they could do just one for him and johnny would take the, the second one and wouldn't complain about it, whereas warwick probably would so warwick was eased out and that was there was a bit of Ed got a bit of bad press about that but i'd and, and i kind of made a bit of loose fun about that in this almanac but but not too serious you know and i thought oh, it's not it's not that's that it surely can't be offended by that and then i remembered something else There'd been a similar thing. I'd done this in Autosport, by the way. There'd been a similar one in Motoring News, or now called Motorsport News, then called Motoring News. Well, they'd done a similar sort of thing, but they had been really harsh. And they'd made reference to his mother. They'd said something about Ayrton Senna's mother decides the policy. That was really, and I thought, oh, God, he thinks that's me. So I... I uh, thought, what do I do about this? And my, my wife at the time had worked in Brazil and I showed her and she said, that's it. She had the mother in Brazil. That's mother anytime is, is, is sacrosanct, but in Brazil particularly. She said, that'll be it. I said, oh God, what do I do? I didn't write that. So what I did was I took a photocopy of my column from Autosport, posted it to him and said, listen, I think this is maybe where the offense, you feel the offense lies. I'm really sorry if I have offended you. I didn't mean to. Please to accept my apology hoping he'd read it and go, oh, that's not what I thought it was, and put two and two together, which apparently Annie Bradshaw told me he did. He worked out it wasn't me, okay? But he never forgave me because I'd even, uh, there'd been a mild piss take, you know, very mild, but I'd been to his house and that was a no-no. And, and for the rest, of, it, it took until Hockenheim in July, Hockenheim in July until he, he saw me and we were coming, walking through the paddock and we couldn't avoid each other. And he said, OK, he just suddenly said, OK, it wasn't you, but you still were rude about me and walked on. And he never, ever forgave me. And here's the end of the story. 
we we I would be in group interviews with him, and he'd be okay. He'd, he'd recognize me, and he'd, he'd 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 answer my questions, but he would never do a one to one with me. Uh, he just I was I'd made him perhaps he was angry because I'd made him look not stupid, but I'd caught him out not meaning to. Anyway, we move on to 1994, right? He's joined Williams. I'm working with Damon Hill. We're doing a book together, and I'm with Damon all the time. And I'm thinking, this is going to be interesting because I'm going to be hanging around the Williams motorhome. Ed's going to see me. He's going to find it hard to avoid me. And I'm also getting on with his number two driver. What's he going to do about this? And we went to the second race at Aida in Japan. Both Williams were out early, and uh, I and Dam- I had to write Damon's column, so I had to interview Damon after each race. So I went up to the Williams office, and I opened the door, and the whole team were sitting around the table watching the end of the race, and a big, big, big square, a huge, big table, all of them, engineers, drivers, what? And there was Damon, Ayrton's engineer, and Ayrton. Damon looked around, beckoned me over, and I went in and sat beside Damon. And Ayrton's sitting, looking at the screen, looking around, sees me, does a double take like this, because I'm in the Williams Sacrist, I'm in the Holy of Holies. I just say, what the hell? Sees me talking to Damon and makes no comment. So I'm thinking, okay, take this on board. I'm hoping then what we'll do is we'll see each other and we'll say, look, can we shake hands and say, let bygones be bygones? Because I think by then, time enough time would have passed to do that. The next time I saw him was uh, at Imola. On uh, race morning, I'm walking through the paddock with um, Georgie, Damon's wife. And Ed's coming the other way. And he says, hi, Georgie. And he looks at me and he shakes hands and walks on. And that was the last I saw him. So I never got to know what would happen. So it's a sad ending in a way. But So that was a, a very interesting relationship I had with uh, Ed and Senna. Oh yeah, very interesting, F- fascinating stories you've been telling, Morris. Honestly, this is this has been great content for us. Um, one one last question, I think, before before we let you go, is just about this season. We gave a quick mention to this season. It's been a fascinating battle for out. We've we've loved covering it uh, on the show. Just want to get your thoughts on it, and uh, uh, can I press you for a prediction as well? There's two <laughs> ra- there's two rounds left to go, but because this season's been so exciting, you you just can't call it for sure. You're absolutely right. I, I knew you were going to ask me that. And, uh, <laughs> I, and I knew what the answer would be. It is, I don't know. And I'm delighted to say I don't know. I have loved this season because we've been waiting, what, four, five, six years for this, haven't we? Mm. Uh, we've been waiting for Lewis to have competition. And he's wanted it too. That's the great thing, isn't it? Because he's always said, he, he, going out front, it's not what he's about. He likes to race. He's a racer. And Max is, is finally Red Bull. I've got their act together at the beginning of the season rather than the end. So finally, we've got this great competition between the two. The both of them are driving out of their skins. We've had some fantastic competition. <sighs> Who's going to win? I, I mean, did you see Alan Prost was interviewed by Martin on the grid at, at the weekend? And Prost said, I don't know who's going to win. But he did say, um, and I remember writing that down, I think that's a good quote. He said, whoever wins is worthy of it. And it's true because they've mm. both been good. I think the only thing I'd say is Lewis Hamilton coming from behind, back against the wall, that's when he's at his most dangerous. Because the number of times I've seen him have setbacks over the years, starting in 07, which was a hell of a year, disastrous mm-hmm. year. But every time he was pushed back, he'd come back fighting. And he's the under, he's, he's, he's coming from beneath. But Max, if it's all down to look, if, who gets the tires working, you know, where, where the number twos are to come into play. Who knows? If, if you really twisted my arm, although Max has got the advantage of the points, and Lewis has got the experience of uh, having won seven championships. He's been through this really hot moment that's coming up. And, and I've heard Max say, look, what the hell? If we lose it, we'll lose it. No, come on. When we get to Abu Dhabi and the, the whole of Holland is there, all the Dutch press are there, the pressure there. I've seen this so many times. The, 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 the final round of the championship, there is pressure like you wouldn't believe. And it's going to be a big test of Max as to how he copes. If, if that weekend starts to go wrong, you know, and he's, he's nip and tuck between the two, I think Lewis will be better prepared for any setback than Max will be. But I, I just can't call it. I, I'm sorry. I, I really can't call it. <laughs> don't don't apologise. We're the same. You know, the amount of times that we've said on the show, oh, it's Verstappen's championship to lose now. Oh, it's Hamilton's championship yeah. to lose now. It, you, you just can't call it. You, you cannot call it. And that's that's the beauty in it. That's... 
That's why we love Formula One. People say it's boring and predictable. We don't see that. No it's way. None of that. That's been and, brilliant. And just just to bring it back to topic, can you imagine what Murray would have been like with this season? <laughs> it would have been. I think it would have finished him off if he was still oh. around during this season. Jeez, he would. He would absolutely love this season. He would, I mean, can I think you? I think he'd find a whole other octave, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would, can you imagine him in Brazil at turn four, Anderson? Oh turn four. Incredible, look at that, and they're off, they're both off, they're both. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been and Verstappen appeared to push Hamilton off the track. Now let's look at the onboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, he'd be probably wondering. mix him up with Perez, though, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, it would. <laughs> Bless him. Oh. God, yeah. Oh, so yeah, it's a fascinating season and, and a fascinating book as well that you've you've made, Morris. Definitely, definitely recommend it. It's available in all good book shops now, of course, and on audiobook as Tom is uh Tom is modeling the physical book there. His is in a lot better state than mine because I don't I'm I'm not very careful with my books sometimes, <laughs> and I've also got a toddler, so yeah. <laughs> there we go. But yeah, th- thank you for joining us, Morris. Really do appreciate it. It's been a fantastic chat. This has been a great interview. Uh, Tom George, thank you very much. A, for your time, and B, for giving Murray coverage, because I, I think, regardless of what I've done, the man thoroughly deserves it, and it's, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been lovely talking to you both. Thank Absolute you. pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Lovely to have you on, your show, on the show. Absolutely, yes. And, and if you did enjoy this show, you can leave us a five-star review on iTunes, and you get a shout out at the start of the next show. We also have free competitions running as normal to, to, for you guys to win some merchandise like the shirt that I'm wearing right now. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel. You have to comment on one of our videos or you can leave us a review on iTunes. There's three competitions, three chances to win. So get entering, guys. And yes, we've just hit over 300 subscribers on YouTube. Search for F1 Grid Talk on YouTube uh, to be able to find us. We're also available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, and Pocket Cash. Just search for the F1 Grid Talk and all of those. And we have over 150 episodes now, which you can find all on the F1 Chronicles website, f1chronicle.com. Tom, of course, I did mention that you're a part of the monkey seat as you're showing as well with your background, if you want to do a little plug for that as well. Oh, it's very kind of you. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're on the monkey seat. Myself and Carl do uh, do uh, race reviews similar to Grid Talk and uh, much more laid back, less professional to the mates having a laugh reviews. So uh, come and give us a listen if you want a much less professional version of what George does and the team. <laughs> <laughs> Morris, is there anything else you want to plug? Your Twitter, your website, anything like that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm happy. Thank you very much. And um, more power to you guys for doing what you do, because I think it's great to get the word out there and to, to be able to chat about it. I wish I'd had something like this in my day when I was starting off, because we would, we would just go down the pub, me and my mates, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alcohol may or may not be involved in our productions yeah. either, but we'll leave that to your imagination. So, yes, yeah. uh, we'll be back on Saturday to preview the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Like we said, we don't know which way the championship's going to go, but we'll give our best takes on that ahead of the race. Thank you very much for joining us, guys, and we'll see you for the next one. Goodbye. <laughs>